Hello, everyone. I'm Sam Kors. I'm an analyst at ARK Invest, and I focus on robotics, energy storage, and aerospace. And today we're going to be talking about orbital aerospace as a big idea. So orbital aerospace is really enabling global connectivity, and that's what we're going to focus on. Uh, and it's interesting because space is definitely an area of convergence where you have all of these different technologies, AI, mobile connectivity, 3D printing, robotics coming together uh, to enable these cost declines. And the three big cost declines that we're going to be focusing on today are rocket launch cost declines, satellite cost declines, and end user antenna cost declines. And according to our research, uh, satellite broadband revenues could approach $10 billion in the U.S. and $40 billion globally in the next five to 10 years. So this is definitely a long-term vision and we're seeing those cost declines happening today, uh, but it will it will require that uh, looking out five years because it's so complicated to get all of these satellites up into orbit. And then lastly, we're going to touch on hypersonic point to point travel, uh, which we think could be a very exciting opportunity. And it could scale from zero dollars today. Uh, it's not it's not happening uh, to a two hundred seventy billion dollar annual revenue opportunity. So first, we're going to dive in to those launch cost declines. And we think that rocket reusability is going to be key to lowering costs uh, by an order of magnitude and potentially two orders of magnitude. But I think it's helpful to take a step back and kind of look at the history of the uh, launch industry. And that's this chart on the left. And you can see that back in 2006, uh, the Russian Soyuz rocket was $71 million, and the Atlas V rocket was $118 million. And then cost ballooned over time. There wasn't really competition. Uh, and by 2015, you know, about 10 years later, uh, those costs ballooned to $210 million and $164 million, respectively. Then you had SpaceX come in with its Falcon 9 rocket, and it wasn't a revolutionary cost. Uh, if you look historically, it was the same cost of the Soyuz before all of those uh, inflation and ballooning of costs due to lack of competition. So they came in and they reset it uh, and they turned the trend from increasing launch costs to declining launch costs. So in this chart on the right, uh, you can see those same launches from the left, but now it's looking at it on a dollars per kilogram to low Earth orbit basis. And you can see that the Atlas V was, you know, roughly $14,000. Uh, the Ariane 5 uh, was in that $6,000 range. And that 2015 Falcon 9 was just below $5,000. Now, today, uh, you know, if we're looking at the 2020 reusable Falcon 9, 2021, where SpaceX has flown the same rocket booster 11 times, which is incredible in and of itself, uh, those costs are already declining. They're less than half of what they were five years ago. And when we're modeling out at the potential rapid reusability of the Starship rocket, uh, that could come all the way down to $200 per kilogram to low Earth orbit. And uh, you know, if you listen to what Musk is saying and the way that he's thinking about reusability, it has the potential to come all the way down to $20 per kilogram to low Earth orbit. And you know, re the ability to reuse these rockets and refurbish them quickly is key to these lowering and declining launch costs. Uh, and here again, looking at the history of it, you have the space shuttle, which averaged 252 days uh, between reusing the rocket. And the fastest that they ever got to was 54 days. Uh, meanwhile, you have SpaceX with their first reuse. It took them 356 days. And already in 2021, they're down to 27 days. So twice as fast as the space shuttle ever was. Uh, and this is just with the Falcon 9. When we're looking and modeling the Starship rocket, uh, that could come down to hours. So, you know, this is, I think, a great metric to track over time, and one that should be really illustrative of how these cost declines for rockets uh, is emerging and evolving. And these lower launch costs are opening up low Earth orbit. And so now this ties into the satellite cost decline, so that second element. And so lower satellite launch costs uh, should enable global coverage with low latency. And here, hopefully, I'll break down the difference between geostationary orbit and low Earth orbit. And I think 
you'll you'll have more knowledge than probably 80 percent of the population hopefully uh and have a good sense of why these cheap rocket costs uh, are opening up this new ecosystem so on the right you have the geostationary satellite and the benefits for this satellite are that you only need three for global coverage. You can see that since it's 22,000 miles away, it covers roughly a third of the earth. So that's good, you only need three of them. Uh, and there's less issues with population density and connecting people to the internet because you can uh, really focus all of your bandwidth into a small area. Uh, but the downside is since it's so far away, uh, there's a lot of latency and this has prevented kind of their broadband internet offerings from taking off. The other downside is that they're very big satellites uh, and expensive. So they're super far away. They need to have a lot of power. Uh, and so oftentimes these satellites can cost more than the rocket launch itself. And then the other, you know, maybe it's positive, maybe it's negative, is that they typically have a 15 year lifespan. So you have a lot of time to amortize the costs, uh, but at the same time, technology is moving so quickly and you're not upgrading the technology for 15 years. Then we look to the left side and what low rocket cost launches are enabling. And this is the low Earth orbit satellite. Uh, this is you know, just 300 miles above the Earth. And as you see in this photo, since it's so close to the Earth, you need dozens to you know, tens of thousands of these to get global coverage. So you need to have that low launch cost in order to get global coverage. Uh, but since they're so close, you know, they're cheaper, they're far cheaper than geosynchronous satellites. Uh, they have way lower latency uh, and the lifespan for them is roughly five years. So they're continuously getting upgraded uh, though it's a shorter amount of time to amortize the costs over. Uh, and then unlike the geostationary, uh, the low earth orbit does run into some issues with population density uh, and that's being worked on currently. So that gives you kind of this setup of the old world, the geostationary, and the new world, which is being opened up. Uh, and that's that low Earth orbit constellation. Next, we have the antenna cost declines. And this is that final element to make the satellite broadband opportunity really come to life. And our modeling suggests that antenna costs could drop below $500 in the next few years. And this is based on limited data uh, because Starlink is really just starting off. Uh, but we're modeling an adoption curve for Starlink users. And our research suggests that um, user antennas could drop from the $1,000 today to roughly $500 after cumulative production reaches 1 million units, which we think will be by the end of 2023. So on the left, you can see this is actual Starlink user data uh, that's been put out there from various tweets and reports uh, on Twitter. Um, and so that's where we shape our adoption curve. And then on the right, you see a Wright's Law cost decline curve for the antenna. And so Wright's Law states that for every cumulative doubling of production, you get a fixed percent cost decline. And so using that and the adoption curve, we get to this $500 mark in the next couple of years. Uh, and it's so important for this antenna cost to come down because it's very hard to scale a business if every user is costing you uh, you know, $1,000 to subsidize the adoption. And it's a large upfront cost for someone to put out there in order to get connected to the internet. Uh, but all of these launch, all of these cost declines that we just mentioned, launch costs, satellite costs, and antenna cost declines, uh, you know, this isn't passing by companies. They're realizing how big this opportunity is. And it's increasing the number of satellites scheduled for orbit. And so if you look at the number of active satellites orbiting Earth, it's nearly doubled in the past two years. And according to public data, uh, companies are planning an order of magnitude increase in satellite launches during the next 10 years. Uh, and that's what you see on this chart on the right. And this 75,000 uh, satellites planned for launch is up 3x from last year. And this is companies rushing to claim spectrum uh, recognizing that this is it's somewhat of a, a space grab, if you will, uh, recognizing the opportunity and trying to get out ahead of it. Uh, and the cool thing about Wright's Law is that you don't just uh, have the ability to model the launch cost decline, the antenna cost decline, uh, those components. 
it can actually model the whole system as well. As well. And so Wright's law forecasts the cost decline for satellite bandwidth. And this is really exciting. I think it's pretty incredible. Since 2004, the cost of satellite bandwidth has dropped 7,500 fold from $300 million per gigabit per second to $40,000 per gigabit per second. And our research suggests that it could fall another 40 fold to $1,000 per gigabit per second, thanks to Starship, uh, SpaceX, and those next generation satellites that they're putting up. And so, you know, this is somewhat of an abstract number here. Uh, but what does it actually mean? You know, we think that one gigabit per second could serve 200 customers at a capital cost of $1,000 per gigabit per second. Uh, this means the company could recoup its investment with a one-time charge of just $5. Uh, so that's pretty incredible. There's definitely a lot of uh, steps to go from here to there, but it does seem possible. Uh, I'll note that you know this calculation doesn't incorporate ground infrastructure cost or satellite utilization. So it's not the full picture, but it is representative of how dramatic these cost declines are uh, and what it means for the market. And so what does the satellite internet market look like? Uh, we think that the high paying customers are gonna be those early adopters and drive down costs and opening up the market. And we see the market really split into two. And it's going to be a high number of low paying customers and a low number of high paying customers. So in this chart on the left, you can see that it's like 83% of the people who would be uh, in the addressable market for satellite internet uh, can really only afford to pay one to $20 per month. So very low price point, but high number of people. But then if you look at the chart on the right and you look at it on a revenue basis, you can see that there's actually two equal, two roughly equal buckets of those people paying 10 to $20 per month. And those people who can be those early adopters and spend 75 to a hundred dollars per month. And when we break it down at a very high level, uh, you can see how we get to the $10 billion per year in the US and $40 billion globally during the next five years. In the US, there's roughly 42 million people who don't have access to broadband internet, 2.6 people per household, uh, and let's say roughly $600 per year for the broadband bill. That's 10 billion. And that's that uh, lower number, higher paying representative. And then for that global opportunity, this is the high number of people but can't afford as much. So you have 3 billion people, uh, you know, five people per household and $60 for the entire year as your broadband bill. And that gets to $40 billion. The other interesting thing with this opportunity is the opportunity to connect planes, trains, and cars uh, to the internet. And this is a great market for satellite internet because it's far harder to uh, connect a wire to a moving boat in the ocean or to a plane in the sky. So this is a great opportunity for satellite internet to really flex its capabilities. And that could be a $43 billion opportunity in 2026. And then lastly there, anecdotally, we're hearing that a lot of government uh, agencies are very interested uh, in satellite connectivity and capability. So that's another growth area to watch. Uh, so that kind of sums it up for the satellite broadband opportunity. And now we'll touch on how we're thinking about this hypersonic point to point market. So if you look on the chart on the right here, you can see how we break it down. Hypersonic point-to-point -point travel, probably most applicable to those long haul flights. And so if you take the number of people who fly, roughly four and a half billion people flying, and you say 15% of flights are longer than seven hours, then you get down to 680 million people. And then you say, who are those early adopters? Who are those people who are gonna pay up and help adopt this technology and drive volume and drive costs down for the rest of us. Uh, those are probably the people who fly private today. So just 0.4% of those 680 million people uh, are that addressable market. And then you have these 2.7 million people uh, who we think should be willing to pay $100,000 per flight. And that's how we get that $270 billion uh, annual revenue opportunity. Why $100,000? 
Well, if we look at the private flight market today, uh, a lot of those private flights are being done by people or businesses to save time. And it, it's, if you model it out, it's roughly $15,000 for every two hours saved. So you can imagine that on a flight uh, from New York to Japan, where you're saving 13 hours, uh, you know, instead of a 15 hour flight, now it's two to three hours due to the hypersonic technology, uh, that they should be willing to pay $100,000. And like many other technologies we look at, uh, there should be a cost decline curve here where those early adopters pay more. And over time, uh, we think that the technology could actually come down and be competitive with international business class flights today. All right, so that sums up the orbital space big ideas. And I hope you enjoyed that research. For more, you know, feel free to reach out on Twitter. And as always, you can see our research on arc-invest.com.